Have you ever read the letters that went back and forth between St. Augustine and Jerome about Bible translation? If you haven't, this is going to be a surprising and maybe even shocking episode for you. It turns out that the strong tendency to claim that your favorite traditional translation of the Bible isn't new at all and was happening all the way back in the 4th century. This was a type of KJV onlyism at an epic scale because it involved arguments between church fathers. I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. The other day I stumbled across this interesting book called Jerome and the Jews, Innovative Supersessionism by William Crewson. As you've heard on this podcast before, Jerome is behind the translation of the Bible into Latin called the Vulgate. Now, even though I've studied a lot of church history, I hadn't seen some of the details highlighted in this book about Jerome's translation of the Bible. It's instructive for all of us today and It was mind-blowing to me. But before we get to any crazy stuff, let's remind ourselves of who this Augustine guy was. He was born in the year 354 AD in what is now Algeria in North Africa, and he became a Christian at the age of 31. His most famous book is probably The Confessions, which he wrote as an autobiographical prayer to God recounting his conversion experience. I still remember reading it for the first time in college and absolutely loving it. And in order for us to grasp a little bit of how monumental this guy has been and his influence on the Western church throughout history, I want us to listen together to what John Piper said about him back in 1998 in a fabulous pastor's talk called, The Swan is Not Silent, Sovereign Joy in the Life and Thought of St. Augustine. The man's influence is simply incalculable, as you know. Adolf Harnack said that the greatest man the church has possessed between Paul and Luther is Augustine. Now, Harnack was German, he had to say Luther, but others have said things differently than that. For example, Christian History Magazine, without any qualification or hesitation, said, now this is written just a few years ago, after Jesus and Paul, Augustine of Hippo is the most influential figure in the history of Christianity. Benjamin Warfield said, argued in his writings on Augustine, that he entered both the church and the world as a revolutionary force and not merely created an epoch in the history of the church, but determined the course of its history in the West up to the present day. He said he had a literary talent second to none in the annals of the church. And then he added, the whole development of Western life in all its phases was powerfully affected by his teaching. Now, one of the most remarkable things about his influence is that it has flowed into remarkably contradictory camps. So, for example, he is revered as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, father in the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. And Warfield said, Augustine gave us the Reformation. Well, that's odd. (laughs) He said that, quote, not only because Luther was an Augustinian monk, or that Calvin quoted Augustine more than any other theologian, but because the Reformation witnessed the ultimate triumph of Augustine's doctrine of grace 
over the legacy of the Pelagian view of man. Both sides in the controversy, the reformers and the counter-reformation, appealed on a huge scale to the texts of Augustine. There are unresolved issues in Augustine. One way of putting it that Warfield did use was the Reformation was the triumph of Augustine's view of grace over Augustine's view of the church. I don't want to make much of that, but something like that is probably the case because as I read his views on sacraments and baptism, I cannot put them together with some other things that he says, but that's for another time. I'm not expert enough in Augustine to resolve those things. There are reasons for why Augustine has had such a phenomenal impact. Augustine was a philosopher, theologian, mystic, and poet in one. His lofty powers complemented each other and made the man fascinating in a way difficult to resist. He is a philosopher, but not a cold thinker. He is a theologian, but also a master of spiritual life. He is a mystic, but also a pastor. He is a poet, but also a controversialist. Every reader thus find something attractive and even overwhelming, depth of metaphysical intuition, rich abundance of theological proofs, synthetic power and energy, psychological depth shown in spiritual ascents, and a wealth of imagination, sensibility, and mystical fervor. Now, why go through the trouble of introducing Augustine at length if we're here to talk about Jerome and his Bible translation? Good question. It's because I want you to feel the weight of how imposing Augustine was and has been in the history of the church so that we can all feel the contrast of the awkwardness of what we're going to hear him advocate with Jerome's translation. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Now, Jerome, let's talk about him. He was born between 342 and 347, so he was about 10 years older than Augustine. He later moved to Jerusalem and Bethlehem to work on a new translation of the Bible into Latin based on the original Hebrew instead of the Septuagint. Now, the Latin version of the Old Testament had been based on the Septuagint up until that point. And it's commonly known today as the Vetus Latina or Old Latin. Now, to us in the year 2022, it seems like a no-brainer that everyone would want a translation of the Hebrew Bible based on the Hebrew, right? But that was not the case at all at the time. Jerome faced significant opposition from Augustine himself, who considered the Septuagint authoritative, and sufficient. The author Crusen writes that he urged Jerome to cease his Hebrew translation and maintain the Septuagint as the source in order to maintain a church unity centered on the supremacy of the Septuagint and established tradition. His path to the Hebrew text was not a straight line, however. The ambivalence of Jerome's textual supersessionism surfaces when the entire range of his statements about the Greek and Hebrew texts are considered. Namely, he makes contradictory statements about the Septuagint, sometimes commending it, but usually condemning it. He consistently chooses the Hebrew text when the Septuagint differs, and as an answer to his critics, he composed a work entitled Hebrew questions on Genesis to defend his textual selection and to illustrate the rich resources found only in the Hebrew. Up to that point, only rarely had Christians cared to consult the Jewish text, and now there's this Christian monk arguing in favor of it. Now, by the way, supersessionism is a big word for what is sometimes called replacement theology which 
teaches that the Christian church has superseded or replaced the ancient nation of Israel as the true Israel of God. This was a big issue back then and still is today. You can see how an extreme position of supersessionism would cause someone like Augustine to claim the Septuagint as the authoritative version of the Old Testament to distance it from the Hebrew, which was so closely tied to the Jewish nation. The fresh and vitriolic debates of the first few centuries of Christianity between Jews and Christians had negative impacts on a lot of people, including Augustine, causing them to distance themselves from their Hebrew roots and look down upon everything Hebrew as irrelevant or inferior. So this also caused the knowledge of Hebrew to be lost and never learned by people like Augustine. As my professor, Dr. Gentry, so eloquently put it, Augustine didn't know bananas about Hebrew. And this must have led to an insecurity as well, since we all tend to avoid something written in a language we don't understand. And as my friend Mark Ward has observed before, there is a notoriously widespread ignorance of Hebrew among KJV onlyists. Now, returning to Jerome, let's listen to what he has to say about the Septuagint in a letter to a woman named Marcella, who was a widowed patron in Rome. Here he's responding to her questions about one of the Psalms by rejecting the Septuagint's readings and preferring another basis of the original text. Here's what he says. Therefore, it remains for us to return to the source, the Hebrew words, and see how they are written. Crusen writes, Such words likely sounded radical for Latin-speaking Christians in the 4th century who were using sacred texts of the Old Testament written in Latin that had been translated 250 years earlier from the Greek language. Jerome equipped himself for a lifelong battle against the ingrained Christian tradition. He learned the Hebrew language, secured ancient Hebrew scrolls, hired Jewish teachers, visited the forbidden territory of the synagogues, settled in the ancient Israelite homeland, and obtained financial support for his literary endeavors. And as a result of these iconoclastic actions, Jerome revised the narrative of Christian supersessionism by redirecting the source of the Christian Old Testament to the Hebrew texts. It's of major significance that one individual should attempt to reorient the foundation of textual authority from an enshrined Greek model to a largely unknown and at times despised Jewish one, and that on his own authority. On the other hand, Augustine held the prevailing view of the Christian church, whose traditions reinforced the dogma that God had inspired the Septuagint before the coming of Christ for later use by Gentile Christians, end quote. Now, Jerome wrote a commentary on Ecclesiastes in 389, and here's what he explains in the preface. He says, translating from the Hebrew, I have adapted my words as much as possible to the form of the 70, that is the Septuagint, but only in those places in which they did not diverge far from the Hebrew. I have sometimes referred also to Aquila, Symmachus, and Theodotion so as not to deter the reader's interest by too much novelty, nor, on the other hand, to follow the rivulets of opinions, omitting, against my conscience, the source of truth. Then from around the year 393, we have a letter of Jerome to a friend about his recent translation of the prophets, saying the following, If you read the books of the 16 prophets, which I have rendered into Latin from the Hebrew, and compare the old version with my rendering, you will then see clearly that the difference between them is that between truth and falsehood, end quote. Now, it's important to remember that Jerome had no conception of what scholars now take for granted, namely that the Septuagint reflects a different Hebrew text type from the Hebrew text Jerome read. This other source text underlying the Septuagint agrees at times with Hebrew manuscripts that were discovered in the 20th century near the Dead Sea. Jerome presupposed that there was only one Hebrew source and that it was fixed, 
in contrast to the state of the Septuagint. Now, once again, the Christian world of the late 4th century contentedly presupposed that the Greek Septuagint was inspired by God for use by the Gentile Christian church, in spite of contrary claims found in the letter of Aristius and Philo. As one writer puts it, the most serious charge Jerome had to face while translating the Old Testament according to the Hebrew text consisted in the argument that he was rejecting the divinely inspired version of the Septuagint and had Judaized the Old Testament. One aristocratic Roman Christian even accused him of sacrilege, not for any doctrinal error against the Christian creeds, but for Jerome's translation of a word in the prophets. So let's talk a little more about the entrenched view of the Septuagint's superiority at that time. It went back to the legend of Aristius, which We won't get into here in detail because it's been covered elsewhere so many times, but basically it attributed the Septuagint's origins to a miraculous work of God. So, early Christian writers found the Septuagint ideally suited for use by Gentiles. As Crucian observes, they reasoned that it was commissioned by a Gentile king sanctified by apostolic use in the New Testament, and rejected by the Jews of the early Christian era. It is not surprising that the Gentile Christians, emboldened by the prevailing supersessionism, appropriated the sacred text of the Jews used in the Diaspora. Those who defended, perpetuated, and embellished the legend of Aristius included Justin Martyr. The concept of its divine inspiration and inherent perfection, probably borrowed from Philo, is first seen in the writings of Irenaeus. Clement of Alexandria mentions its divine origin, and Eusebius writes about God's providence in the translation, but not the miracle. Cyril of Jerusalem is the first Christian to include all 22 Old Testament books in the miraculous translation, because the first story only talked about the Pentateuch. Finally, Jerome's contemporary, Epiphanius, provides the longest description of the legend and innovates by situating the translators as working in pairs in the miraculous story. Jerome began to dismantle the entrenched Christian attachment to the Septuagint using the following strategy. First, he denied the myth of divine origin by delegitimizing its veracity. He wrote, I do not know who was the first author whose lie constructed 70 cells in Alexandria in which they were divided and yet all wrote identical words, since Aristius and long after Josephus have reported no such thing, but write that they were assembled in a single hall and conferred together, not that they prophesied. For it is one thing to be a prophet and another to be an interpreter, In one case, the spirit predicts future events. In the other, erudition and command of language translate those things which he understands. End quote. So, Jerome makes a careful distinction between being a translator and a prophet, since the gift of prophecy necessarily entails the presence of the spirit who guarantees divine authority. Jerome works backwards to diffuse that authority by denying the translator's gift of prophecy. Although Jerome never divulges the source of his doubts about the Septuagint myth, I am inclined to agree with Naomi Seidman's suggestion that Jerome, knowledgeable of contemporary rabbinic opinion, agreed with their assessment of the Septuagint's inaccuracy. Her reading of the Talmud sees the rabbi's teaching that the Septuagint contained intentional mistranslations provided by divine inspiration that were intended to deceive Christians. Quote, the Talmud presents the composition of the Septuagint as an elaborate Jewish trick. End quote. Jerome admits his awareness of 4th century rabbinic opinion about the letter saying, the Jews say it was done wisely in deliberation, so Ptolemy, the worshiper of one God, might not yet discover a double divinity with the Hebrews, end quote. It is not unreasonable to assume that he borrowed their view and adapted it to his Christian purpose, thus armed with insight garnered from his trusted Hebrew teachers, Jerome launched an attack from within the Christian church 
on the received Christian text of the Old Testament. Now, we're still listening to Crusen writing on this. Second, he stressed, Jerome stressed, that the original text of the Septuagint had been hopelessly corrupted by later recensions. In a prologue to the second translation of Chronicles from the Hebrew in the year 396, Jerome says the Septuagint is corrupted and violated. He then describes exactly how the original Septuagint text is corrupt in its three recensions used by Christians throughout the Roman Empire. He writes, Those in Egypt used the recension of Hesychius. Those in Constantinople and Antioch used that of Lucian. And those of the area of Palestine used Origen's Hexapla. There are also differences due to copying errors within the three recensions. End quote. Now, the book of Daniel provides for him a prime example of such confusion. The churches of the Lord and Savior do not read the prophet Daniel according to the 70 translators, he says, but they use instead the edition of Theodotion. But I do not know why this happened. This one thing can I affirm, that it is considerably out of harmony with the true text, and it is repudiated by correct judgment. Now, Crusen continues saying, Jerome intended his new translation to correct this confusion of multiple recensions and the shameful inconsistency of the Christian church in accepting and using them. The other texts led to embarrassment among Christians when they argued with Jews. The playing field was rendered uneven. If Christians would debate from the same sacred text, presumably Christians wouldn't lose, or at least might not be embarrassed when the Septuagint differed with the Hebrew scrolls. So Jerome writes, The Jews generally laugh when they hear our version of this passage of Isaiah, but how shall we deal with the Hebrew originals in which these passages and others like them are omitted? Passages so numerous that to reproduce them all would require books without number. End quote. Jerome thus marshals an apologetic reason for his new translation among Christians, since he himself knows firsthand the strength of debating from the same texts. Now, third, his third strategy, in an amazing turn from his rejection of the inspiration of the 70 translators, Jerome reasons that they purposefully hid Christological prophecies from the pagan king. So listen to this quote from Jerome. It's going to have a little bit of a former quote, but expanded. So here we go. The Jews say it was done wisely in deliberation. So Ptolemy, the worshiper of one God, might not yet discover a double divinity with the Hebrews. He made them do so chiefly for this reason, because he was seen to fall into the dogma of Plato. Accordingly, wherever anything sacred in Scripture is witnessed of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they are either translated otherwise, or they have passed over all in silence. So they might both satisfy the king and might not divulge the secret of the faith. End quote. It's actually staggering to realize that Jerome was the only figure in the early church who regarded the original text of the Old Testament as authoritative over against the Septuagint. And here's another point that he made, quote, The New Testament authors quoted from the Old Testament at least five times with no corresponding passage in the Septuagint, only in the Hebrew. And here's his list of passages. Matthew 2.15, Out of Egypt have I called my son, which is quoted from Hosea 11.1, Matthew 2.23, he shall be called a Nazarene, quoted from Isaiah 11.1, John 19.37, they will look upon him whom they have pierced, quoted from Zechariah 12.10, and John 7.38, rivers of living water shall flow from within, quoted from Proverbs 18.4, and then finally, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, things which no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor has arisen in the heart of man, which God has prepared for those who love him, quoted from Isaiah 64, 4. This was a strong argument for Jerome. He said, therefore, let us ask them where these are written, 
And when they are unable to say, we will produce them from the Hebrew texts. In Jerome's mind, any act of concealment in the translation of the scripture is close to blasphemy. He wrote this, How can the Septuagint leave out the word Nazarene if it is unlawful to substitute one word for another? It is sacrilege either to conceal or to set at naught a mystery. End quote. Now, included in all of this controversy was Jerome's clear rejection of the deuterocanonical books as scripture. Since they were not in the Hebrew Bible, he didn't see them as authoritative. And that went against the grain of the time. Crusen writes, These radical positions on text and canon produced a wave of personal attacks upon Jerome. Much of his writing, especially the prologues to his translations of the Old Testament, contains self-justification directed at his opposition. For example, he says, I respond only to my detractors who bite me with dog's teeth, slandering me in public, speaking at corners, the same being both accusers and defenders when approving for others what they reprove me for, end quote. So, now we turn to those letters exchanged between Augustine and Jerome. Let's see what they had to say. There are 17 of these. And in the first one, Augustine writes, When it comes to translating the sacred canonical writings into Latin, I would like you simply to do what you did when you translated the book of Job. In other words, to add signs indicating the points where your translation differs from that of the Septuagint, which has such great authority. I would be very surprised if anything could still be found in the Hebrew texts, which had escaped the notice of all those translators who were such experts in that language. I do think that their work should without doubt be accorded preeminent authority in this field. End quote. Crusen comments, To Augustine, the challenge presented by Jerome's new text is not to be met by obtaining the Hebrew texts and learning the Hebrew language in order to secure its meaning. For him, the concern centers primarily on church authority and only secondarily on textual authority. He couldn't think of a worse position to be in. The debate might be reduced to Hebrew scholars over whom Augustine had little authority, versus Jerome, who was in far away Bethlehem and even then was a fallible authority. It was far safer for Augustine to keep the status quo, a standard text and a unified church, end quote. Now, Jerome responded with the following, I am surprised that you are not reading the Septuagint in the original form as it was produced by the Seventy, but in an edition corrected or corrupted by origin using daggers and asterisks, and that you are not following the translation, undistinguished though it may be, of a Christian, especially when he has removed those editions which came from the edition of a Jew and blasphemer after Christ's passion. If your Jews, as you claim, whether out of spite or ignorance, said that the Hebrew edition contained the same as the Greek and Latin editions, it is clear that they are either ignorant of Hebrew literature or that they deliberately lied so as to make fun of the gourd planters, end quote. In Augustine's final letter about such matters, he takes on a more subdued tone. This is what he says. On the question of our translation, You have now persuaded me of your positive reasons for translating the scriptures from the Hebrew. You wanted to make known to the public what had been left out or corrupted by the Jews. But I ask you, please, to inform me which Jews did this, whether it was those who translated before the coming of the Lord, and if so, which ones or which one, or whether it was those later translators who might be thought to have removed some things from the Greek texts or to have corrupted them, end quote. Jerome insists that one reason he translated from the Hebrew was to engage the Jews in debate and, quote, for the refutation of the Jews, 
even those very copies which they themselves admit are very faithful, so that if they are ever in an argument with Christians, they may not have an avenue of escape, but may be struck down in the main with their own weapon, end quote. He also wrote in the prologue to Kings the following, I beg you not to consider my work as a condemnation of the ancients. In the tabernacle of God, each and every man offers what he can. Some offer gold and silver and precious stones. Others offer cotton stuff, purple garment, scarlet cloth, and hyacinth. We do well if we offer skins and goat's hairs. End quote. So, Jerome continued to cite the Septuagint version, both as a basis for oral instruction as well as his scholarly works, even until the end of his career. Often, the Septuagint was the basis of his spiritual application of the text, but Jerome never allowed it to rise above the Hebrew text. So, The question now is, what became of all this? What became of Jerome's translation in the end? Was it a hit? A bestseller? Did the Pope immediately embrace it? Uh, No. Andrew Kane writes, Jerome's Vulgate translation of the Bible, in many respects, his greatest scholarly achievement was a colossal failure in its own time. End quote. In fact, his translation did not find general acceptance, get this, until the 9th century. And yet, up to the 13th century, monks and priests were still copying and reading old Latin versions of the scriptures. The church resisted Jerome's translation until the Council of Trent in 1546, 15. 46, when the Western Church finally endorsed it as the authoritative Bible for the Roman Catholic Church. So, the church wasn't ready. (laughs) It just blows my mind again. The church wasn't ready for the Hebrew Scriptures until the time of the Reformation, roughly, over 1,100 years after Jerome's arduous labor. Let that sink in for a moment. That may be the longest delay in someone's legacy in all of history. So even though Jerome was older than Augustine and knew more about the text of scripture, Augustine's influence prevailed. And the Western Church's three councils in 393, 397, and 419 approved the Septuagint canon as did Pope Innocent I in 405. And ironically, the same church that ended up adopting Jerome's translation rejected his view of the canon. As one writer puts it, the irony that Jerome's translation was endowed with authority is augmented by the fact that in the meantime, the Apocrypha had become incorporated into the Latin canon. Crusen writes, It was not until the time of the Reformation that the canon question was reconsidered and adopted in Jerome's direction by the Protestant churches. These dual moves toward Jerome's translation and canon are slight but definite projections toward a Jewish orientation. Only in the centuries following the Reformation would the Christian church begin to affirm its debt to the Jewish people. End quote. Well, that's all for this foray into a fascinating moment in history. Let me end with a letter written by Jerome, seven years before his death in 419, where he recalls his first attempt to learn the Hebrew language. This is really interesting. In my youth, when the desert walled me in with its solitude, I was still unable to endure the promptings of sin and the natural heat of my blood. And although I tried by frequent fasts to break the force of both, my mind still surged with evil thoughts. To subdue its turbulence, I betook myself to a brother who before his conversion had been a Jew and asked him to teach me Hebrew. Hebrew. 
It may be a good idea for some of us to do the same in the new year. So thanks again for listening. If you enjoyed this and got something out of it, it would be so helpful if you left a review on Apple Podcasts. We believe the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. And this podcast exists ultimately to help us treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.